<laughs> how truly wonderful it is to see those that we have prayed so fervently for, for the sicknesses that they've been enduring and for the prayers that have been answered. What a great and wonderful moment to be able to see the God of heaven who is merciful and gracious and is one that does answer prayers. And we're thankful to him. And we need to be just as fervent in the giving of thanks for the things that he has done for those that have been sick. And it's so good to, to see each and every one in our audience this morning. So sad to, about <clears throat> the Brother David and Sister Kelly. And of course, as it always seems in any situation, things could be worse. But they were as bad enough as they were. And we're thankful that they were no worse. But pray that good can come from this in some fashion, some form or another. So thankful to see everyone in our study this morning. Hope that our worship of God will be in spirit. Our hearts will be involved in all of what we've already done in the singing and the praying and the remembrance of our Savior as we partook of his flesh and took of his blood. And now that we can give attention to his word. <clears throat> and I trust that you will receive the word, not as it is the words of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. So I appreciate and hope that all of us can be better for the time that we've been together this day. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'd like for us to begin reading in verse 13. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and being assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want us to note that what we have read in these verses, Paul is telling Timothy concerning the things that he has heard, he says, you have been assured of. In other words, the things that Timothy has heard, be it through Paul, be it through his grandmother, be it through his mother, were things that which he could have no doubt. These are things that truly he could rest assured in being the truth. But what I'd like for us in our study this morning is to look at brethren with too many relatives. To be assured of is to know that there are things that are absolute. And yet, in talking about the word relative here in the title of this lesson, I'm not speaking about relatives in the sense of being kin blood relations, or anything of that nature. Instead, what I'm talking about is relatives in the sense of being opposite of absolute. That's what we're using the term relative to have reference to. In fact, let's just give them a definition. Relativism is the theory of knowledge and ethics that holds that the criteria of judgment are relative varying with the individual, time, and circumstances. In other words, what we're saying concerning relative things is that it holds that the basis of judgment, that standard that which we use to base our judgment, is relative. It varies according to, as the definition says, according to the individual, it varies according to different periods of time, and under different circumstances. That is what we're talking about when we talk about relative. The word absolute or absolutism is the quality of being absolute or certain. Positivism. In philosophy, any doctrine involving the existence of an absolute. 
So there's quite a difference then in the difference of these two words. What's relative depends. What's absolute is absolute. You know, there's some people that feel that viewing any truth as being absolute, that really that's not being very smart. And to them, the things that are mentioned in Psalms 119, verse 89, the things that God has settled in heaven, <clears throat> to them, those things are becoming fewer and fewer as time goes on. We know that it says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And the reason they say that there are fewer and fewer things that are settled, that are absolute, is not because they have found scriptural evidence to the contrary of their being absolute. It's not that. But it's because truth to them doesn't just seem to work. It just doesn't seem to fit exactly in our present age that you and I live in. You know, it's kind of like the man that was heard describing his son's education. He said he's learning more and more about less and less. By the time he gets through college, he's going to know everything about nothing. And I think that pretty much says it. You know, it's sad, but true. It seems that there are some brethren who sometimes measure their spiritual growth by their degree of uncertainty. I think I have met a few of those through the years. And what I'm saying is, <clears throat> brethren often make truth relative to time, they make it relative to place, and they make truth depend to a great extent upon circumstances. There was a panelist that was discussing modesty that I happened to hear a few years ago. And here was what one statement that one of those panelists made. Nudity is not being inappropriately dressed if that is what a particular culture allows. See, that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about truth being relative. And we're talking about it here in, in terms of modesty. And I, I, don't, I can't think of many, any, many other matters or subjects other than modesty that truly has fallen victim to this relative idea. So this kind of an expression, this kind of a statement by people of the world is certainly not very much surprising, or at least it isn't to me. But then sometimes I hear brethren talk about, well, you know, modesty in grandma's day is different than modesty in our days, because remember back in grandma's day, it was immodest to show a woman to show her ankles. And so they are those that want to try to, again, put modesty in the terms of time, in terms of circumstance. And in fact, any scripture, for that matter, that deals with this subject of modesty, to them, it's something that must be reinterpreted to fit into the 21st century that you and I live in. It must be interpreted to correspond with that mindset that we now have in our present day and time. But however, the truth of the gospel is absolute truth. It's given, you remember we read a moment ago in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. The very words 
were given by God to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles as they wrote the New Testament. It was not this idea that somehow that inspiration is just God given the thought or given the idea and then the apostles are left to their own words to explain that concept or that idea. No, that's not inspiration. Inspiration is God breathes. The very words of God were given for them to be recorded. So it's given by inspiration from God, and who is God? He is the absolute, one, true, living God. And then too, in Second Peter, notice what we see in chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mount. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You see, these verses, too, give us the definition of inspiration. It's not the idea that God gave the idea, the thought, and the apostles or the writers of the New Testament were left up to choose their own words. As I said, the prophecy never came by the will of man. It's not of any private interpretation. If the writers of the Bible have just been given the thought and were allowed to use their own words, then that would be of their own private interpretation. But Peter very clearly says it's not that way. That's not inspiration. And not only that, he says, those to whom gave us the record of our Lord were eyewitnesses. You can't get no better than an eyewitness. And he gave an example of that how that Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the mount that we sometimes call the Mount of Transfiguration. And there Jesus was transformed. And there was that voice from heaven when they saw Moses and Elijah appear and talk with Christ. And Peter made that statement, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But you remember what the voice said? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear you him. Peter said we were eyewitnesses of that. We were eyewitnesses of the glory and the honor that Christ received from God. So that's the record that we have. That's the truth of the gospel. And that's what we must understand that helps to assure us that it is absolute in what we have. And it's been given to make us sure of more things, not less. Things that have been settled in heaven aren't becoming less and less. They, these things make us sure of these things that have been settled. It's not less and less. It's the fact of the matter that it is as God's word states. This is the absolute in the matter. You know, Timothy, he could be positive about his teaching. We read 2 Timothy 3, but let's go back and look at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. 
and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. See, Paul is telling Timothy, you can be assured. You need to rest assured of the things you've been taught. Why? Because of the source. He said, knowing from whom you have learned them. He learned them from Paul, and of course we know in the other letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, he makes mention of his grandmother and his mother, whose faith that was in them, and Paul was convinced that it was also in Timothy. So Timothy could be assured of the things that he had heard, knowing from whom he had heard them. Now look at 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3. Paul says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So now what's Timothy doing? Timothy has been assured of the things that he has learned. He knows from whom he's learned them. And now he, in turn, is going out and he is teaching others that here is the doctrine, here is the teaching, Here's the absolute truth. Teach no other than this. That's the assurance. That is the absoluteness of the things that Paul had talked about concerning Timothy. And you know, Luke, Luke wrote of things which were most surely believed and they were of infallible words. Let's look at it in Luke chapter 1. For as much as many has taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Most surely believed among us. And notice when it, as he opens the book of Acts, Luke also wrote that book, Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The, thing, <clears throat> the things concerning Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, all of these things were things that they were eyewitness account that could be given Paul made mention of them in, in what he talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 concerning the resurrection of Jesus. How that he was seen of the apostles, how he was seen of others, how he was even among the apostles. And even this passage here by Luke says that he was seen by them during 40 days. This was after his resurrection. Jesus remained with his disciples. You remember Thomas Thomas was not always with the apostles on occasions, and on one occasion when Jesus came to him and it, it was made known to Thomas, Thomas was a little bit hesitant, a little bit doubtful, until it was that Thomas happened to be in the presence of Jesus and with his finger was able to put them into the nail print of his hand and thrust his hand into Jesus' side. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Thomas, because you have seen and believed. But blessed are those that have not seen and believed. How is it that we can not see and believe? It's because we believe in that which is absolute. We believe in that which is infallible. We believe in those things that it says that we can be surely believed. So do we? Is truth that absolute to us? Or is there questions? Is there suspicions? Is there doubts that we have? You know, Paul, he didn't think that truth changed. Whether he went from place to place or given different circumstances, situations that they might arise. Paul didn't think for one minute that truth changed from places, from one place to another, from one situation to another. You remember he rebuked Peter's behavior 
in Galatians chapter 2. There in verse 14, it says, But when I saw, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? See, Peter on this occasion allowed situations to change him. But he was rebuked for it. Why? Because truth is truth. No matter what the situation. No matter if you're in the company of who. Peter was in the company of Gentiles, and then when he heard that Jews were coming to town, he distanced himself. Hypocritical. Certainly. But Paul rebuked him, and Paul shows us that truth, regardless of situations, is still truth. That God is no respect of person. As Peter should full well have known that from Acts chapter 10. That was one of the first words he spoke when he made it into the house of Cornelius. Of the truth I perceive that God is no respect of a person, but him that feareth God and worketh righteousness, to him he is accepted of God. But we see how easy sometimes we can let situations change the truth for us. If we can do it for Peter, we can do it for us. The temptation is certainly there. And then... Notice that Paul preached the same truth everywhere. In 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 17, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Do we think that Paul went to Corinth and talked to Covering and went to some other church and didn't? No. Do we think that Paul went to the churches of Galatia and taught the no need for circumcision to be forced as an act of obedience to Christians and went everywhere else preaching something different? No. Whatever Paul preached in one place, he preached in another. Why is that? Because that's the nature of truth. Truth is absolute. And then one of verse, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all of the churches. So truly, Paul preached the same truth everywhere he went no matter what the subject pertained to. But you know, the truth of the gospel is hindered by brethren with too many relatives. You know, this hindrance is obvious when they make no effort to apply truth that may in some way be stated in a relative term. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 14 and 15, notice it says, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Long hair. What somebody automatically asked, how long is long? Well, there's the matter of distinction, isn't there? Isn't the matter of distinction always held true throughout the scriptures, all the way back to the day of Adam and Eve, all the way up through the Old Testament period of time? And how many references do we have? In fact, we did a lesson on it not too awfully long ago concerning the things that are stated in both Old and the New Testament that shows that God, the principle that God has is that he created them male and female and they need to remain male and female. It's no wonder the homosexuality and this transgender movement that we're seeing in such violent force being forced down our throats 
it all goes back to this blurring of distinction between the sexes. God did not intend for there to be a blur, but a well-defined. He gave it to us biologically. He gave it to us in terms of our clothing. He gave it to us in terms of the length of our hair. Oh, a man can grow long hair, absolutely. A man can do a lot of things that God says he ought not to do. But when God says that a man is not to have long hair, and a woman is, that's what we must do. Why? Truth is absolute. And we must maintain that distinction. And the same is true when it comes to such things as modesty. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, in like manner also women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. So again, it's in like manner also. Propriety, moderation. Now, when does a garment become indecent? When does a garment become immodest? Does that depend upon the time in which we live? Does that depend on like what we read a moment ago that if it, you know, if you're in a situation where wearing nothing is appropriate, then it's not immodest? Is modesty determined by time, place, circumstance? That's where even a lot of Christians have went relative on the subject of modesty. They went relative on a lot of other things as well. But sure, this is how that the gospel is hindered by those with too many relatives. And <clears throat> this hindrance is obvious when they change convictions. When they change their stand, depending upon the time, the place, and the situation. And that's all because, and mainly the reason why this happens, is because they run into these difficult what if. <laughs> Who of us has not been faced with, with someone we talked to that said, well, what, a, what if? And it doesn't matter what it pertains to. It's just a absolute truth that you've read from the scriptures and then the very first words out of their mouth is what if. So this is another way that they have hindered the gospel. By changing their convictions, they run into difficulty, like we said, of application. In fact, J.T. Lewis once made this statement. The Bible wasn't designed to answer every full question some people might think of. And that's true. I say an amen to that. Take, for instance, the necessity of baptism. The Bible is absolute on that. But then somebody comes along and says, well, what if? What if there is a fatal accident on the way for that person to be baptized? Friends, it still doesn't do away with the absolute truth. I still can't teach anything other than he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. A lot of brethren want to say, well, you know, I just can't believe that God would allow a person like that to be lost. Well, if God doesn't allow that person to be lost, that's his business. You know what my business is? My business is to teach the truth. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And not go into all of these what ifs. And therefore, in the end of it all, I have lessened the absoluteness of baptism. That's what I've done. And that's some things that brethren do with these what ifs. There is, of course, the necessity of confessing sins. We had a gospel preacher, well, yeah, we had a, <laughs> a professed gospel preacher up in Virginia, lived right across the line in the Kentucky. And he made the statement that if a person just comes down the aisle, he's confessing his sins. Well, the Bible says confession is with the mouth, doesn't it? Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, for with the mouth 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, there's a lot can be said about a person's character, a person's honesty, and a lot of other things. Of the coming down the aisle, the courage that it takes to be willing to admit sin. But just to say that just the, the act of coming down the aisle is the confession, that's beginning to get into what if. What if they just come down the aisle? Friends, we have to teach what the truth is. The absolute truth is confession is made with the mouth. And then what about when it comes to drawing lines of fellowship? Well, what if? What if they just quit attending? I've heard places where, and myself have heard brethren say, well, we can't withdraw from them because they don't attend here no more. They, they just stopped attending. Well, they were members here. It was a responsibility. The church had toward them and they had toward us being a member of the church here. And just to the fact that they went back on the Lord and just stopped attending doesn't mean that we've lost all responsibility towards them, nor that they have lost all responsibility in regards to the church. So, what does the Bible say? The absolute truth is we withdraw from every person that walks disorderly. So what if? What if? Well, we can't minimize the absolute truth in the matter. And then there's that idea that many of our brethren have that the church can take out of its treasury and send to others that aren't Christians. And so when we argue, as the Bible teaches, that all the evidence that we can see, all the examples that we have in the New Testament concerning the church taking money in the matter of benevolence and giving it to anyone, they were needy, they were destitute saints. Again, I had a preacher up across the Tennessee line. See, we, we live too close to too many states in Virginia. <laughs> it was either Kentucky or Virginia or Tennessee, and they had a radio program. And they got on that radio program and brought four lessons on the fact that the church could assist out of its treasury anyone that was in need, Christians or not. And they tried to make out like that those that believed that only money from the treasury could be given to a saint was a saint's only position and they compared it to faith only. And that, of course, would create a lot of prejudice, I'm sure, in the minds of Christians that were not up on the scriptures that they ought to. Whoa, oh, oh, wait, you know, they're, they're just as guilty of people that believe in faith only. Well, no, it's a matter that what the scriptures teach that it is saints only. And they gave the illustration on one program. They said, here's a man, not a Christian, who comes to the assembly, he stays and remains for the entire worship period. The Lord's Supper is served. Then when the collection basket is passed, he lays a $100 bill in the collection basket. And then after services is over, he goes home and his house is burnt to the ground. And he said, don't you know that them folks down at that church wouldn't give that man a dime of money out of the treasury? Well, what does that do? That creates prejudice, resentment, ill feelings. But see, you weren't going to be honest enough to say, no, they may not take money out of the treasury, but those people down there will help that person any way they can out of their pockets. But no, he didn't mention that. He just wanted to create the prejudice against the truth. But friends, it's not a what if. We can what if any command that God has given us to death, but that still doesn't change the absolute truth in the matter. And two, we can see this hindrance because they run into some unpleasant or some unacceptable situation where here the application needs to be made 
up to truth. Especially when it comes to a loved one, a family member. And they feel like that to stress this absolute truth is going to leave this loved one out when we apply this absolute truth. Many people get upset over what the absolute truth is on baptism. Why? Because they realize their mom and dad either never did or never has or never will obey the gospel. So they want to change the necessity of baptism based upon the fact that this puts the loved one into jeopardy. So we just change the truth. We make the truth relative. Or maybe it's that here's a family member that's a member of some denominational church. So whenever the truth, the absolute truth, is taught concerning the one church, the one body of which Jesus is the builder, Jesus is the purchaser of it with his blood, and he is the head of it. No, that's too absolute because that's condemning my brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, or even my mom and dad. Because here they are, they are members of some denominational church. Or it could very well be a matter in the family that someone has divorced for some reason other than fornication. And they've remarried. Doesn't matter whether they remarried, they're just divorced for some reason other than fornication. Some, some don't understand that divorce is sinful. If it's not for the reason, the only reason that Jesus gave in Matthew 19. So what family is there you can think of that is not to some degree affected by someone that's been divorced and consequently most always remarried and yet they have no right to be remarried. But all of a sudden convictions have changed. I'm known of gospel preachers that have changed their conviction on divorce and remarriage because their daughter engaged in an unscriptural divorce and she's now remarried, she's in adultery, but he changed his position. He used to preach the truth. So we see what we're talking about when we're talking about relative and, con and absolute. And then of course withdrawing that we've talked about and the subject of wilderness. It's easy for Christians to get involved in wilderness <clears throat> in all of its varied forms. But it's sin. And just because my son or my daughter or, my, or some other family relative is involved in it doesn't change the truth. Why? Because truth is absolute. Truth doesn't change. So, <clears throat> let's not be so dogmatic that we cannot be swayed by scriptural evidence. That's what has to be at the basis of all of our faith, of all of our convictions. So let us not be so dogmatic that we cannot be swayed by scriptural evidence, but then neither let us be so open-minded that we can lead and be led into the trap of leaving everything nearly open-ended. No absolutes. It depends. <laughs> depends on time. It depends on place. It depends on situations. And another thing. Let us not be so rigid that we will not examine, nor will we revise our beliefs and practices in light of the Scriptures. Again, that's what there has to, only the basis in which we need to be. But let us not be so rigid that we will not examine or revise our beliefs and practices in the light of the scriptures, but be careful that our readjustments are not on account of some individual, family member, because of the period of time in which we live or because of some circumstance, situation that we find ourselves in. 
So let's close the lesson with this thought being left on our minds. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Let's never lose sight of that. Regardless of the person, regardless of the place, regardless of the time, regardless of the situation, the circumstances. And let us not acquire relatives in those things that God has settled, the things that are absolute. If we do not obey the gospel, the absolute truth is that God will come in flame and fire, taking vengeance on us. We know that from 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9. If we obey not the gospel, it doesn't matter <clears throat> who I am. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who the person is that you're thinking about. It doesn't matter if it's your mother or dad. It doesn't matter if it's your son or daughter. If they do not obey the gospel, they will have vengeance taken upon them in flame and fire. That truth is never going to change. So why not now, the opportunity that we have, if you're here and you've not obeyed the gospel, through the hearing of his word, have the faith that only comes through the hearing of his word. Let that faith motivate you to obey. Have an obedient faith that you're willing to do what you see and read and have been taught in God's word. And that is to repent of your sins. With your mouth, confess the faith that you have that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be willing to be buried with Christ in baptism where we can contact that blood that we have just commemorated and communed with. That power that's in the blood. We sing that song. There's power in the blood. But we only contact that blood when we're buried with Christ. We are buried with Christ when we're baptized into Christ. We can obey the gospel. And regardless of what comes, regardless of when it comes, if we're faithful, heaven can be our home. We don't have to worry about that vengeance that will come. And maybe you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet there are those things that we've talked about. There's worldliness in your life. The world is all around us. It's tempting us every day. It's tempting us almost every moment of the day. When we succumb, let us be honest enough to admit it, acknowledge it. Let us lay aside the sin that does so easily beset us. And as a Christian, let us run with patience, endurance, the race that's set before us. It's not a matter of who finishes first, it's just a matter of finishing. That's the important thing, finishing. And if somewhere you've gotten sidetracked, there are many paths, there are many wide and broad ways to go in this world. But let us go back to that straight gate and that narrow way, because that's what leads to life. If we can assist you in either of these ends, let it be known. Why